We're speaking today with ballerina and now author Georgina Pascovich. Hello. Georgina Pascovich, the rogue ballerina, has danced with the New York City Ballet since 2002 and was promoted to soloist in 2013. A steadily rising star, she is an ambassador of her art on many platforms, crossing over to Broadway, TV, and film in addition to her many appearances at the New York City Ballet, including a celebrated portrayal of Anita in Jerome Robinson's West Side Story, which was the great movie. Her credits include award-winning film Office Jazz, Ivy in the Broadway revival of On the Town, and Victoria in the Broadway revival of Cats. Georgina is a passionate activist for the Orphan Starfish Foundation, and she is co-founder of the globally recognized diversity initiative, Final Bow for Yellow Face. She lives in New York City, and a half hour with her will shake your stereotype of uptight ballerinas to bits. Sure will. Better. Okay, good. How are you today, Georgina? I'm doing well. Okay, Thanks. Great. Thank Thanks for having me, for John. Us here. Yes. You're the first author we've had in person for months. Well, I, that's really only the second since the pandemic. Wow, so that's a particular honor. Yeah. Thank you. So your new book is titled Swan Dive and is published by Henry Holt Publishing. The book is a part memoir of being accepted to and then rising up in the New York City Ballet, which is an outstanding accomplishment. What would you say was the hardest part of this journey and what was the best part? Ooh. What was the hardest part of this journey in writing the book, or this journey in my story rising, of experiencing yeah, the book? Yeah, rising up through the New York City Ballet. Um, <laughs> there are many, many, many okay. hurdles to cover. Um, so I think the hardest part was finding my own voice as a, as a ballerina. And there is this stereotype of what the world thinks a ballerina is, which is mostly silent and obedient. Yeah. I am n neither one of the... <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I can be obedient, but only when I see fit to. <laughs> and um, so that was, it was me finding my own voice and finding my agency in a world that doesn't necessarily want me to have my fullest agency. Okay. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yes. Absolutely. And then what was the most exciting? What was the best part? Oh. Best, most exciting, best, whatever? I mean, the most exciting and best part of this process of becoming a ballerina is achieving yeah. the goal and being able to do what I Incredible. love for a living every single day. And I think that's only been made more clear in this time where we've experienced so much loss and so much um, inner reflection yeah. that I'm just so lucky to be able to come back and now have a book and dance and hopefully bring new audiences to the theater, which is why this is here. Yeah, fantastic. Um, this may require some over simplification, but what would you like readers to get from reading Swan Dive? I would love for readers to understand that the artists that they see on stage are real people, and I want to break down the stereotype of what a ballerina is, and that you have to be of a certain status or class to walk into a theater that ballet is for everyone, and in my particular case, I'm giving you, I'm sharing with you me, and I'm a really humorous person, and there are other really big personalities like mine that are in, in my world of ballet, and I just want you to get to know us, not only on the stage, but off the stage as well. Yeah, your performances, I've seen it, your personality really comes across. It's like, oh. It's oh, thank you, yeah. thank you. Now, how did you choose the title, Swan Dive? This was a this is a back and forth. I wanted to sort of take on Swan Lake because that seems to be the most relatable title. I mean, there was a you know, uh, there's been movies modeled after it and so on and so forth. But I am not uh, I am not an Odette Odile character, and I needed to be true to my authentic self, which is quite humorous. And as a ballerina who actually falls a lot. <laughs> um, I was trying to do a play on words, so I went to sleep pondering this. I woke up at three in the morning, and I was like, "Aha! Swan dive works for me." That's good. I didn't, I didn't realize or catch the Swan Lake reference, but that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, you That's have it. Perfect. That's perfect. You studied at the School of American Ballet, and why is this significant? Studying at the School of American Ballet is significant because it's the feeder school to the New York City Ballet. The only way to really get into New York City Ballet is to study at the school. 
and so that's why it's important yeah. that I came through there. And uh, for me, it, I didn't start my training at School of American Ballet. Yeah, I started in Altoona, yeah. but um, I finished my training there, and that's when I really honed in on the specificity of the balancing technique, which is where I got my wings and to move as fast as I do. Yeah. What happened right after you started studying there? I think there's an incident in your book. I moved to New York City on September 7th of 2001 and the day I started professional children's school and the first week of our classes at School of American Ballet, so it, it, you know, I just left my parents and I'm one of six kids and so it was a huge shift already but then September 11th occurred and it changed all of our lives moving forward. So that was a huge, huge event that kind of... How did it affect you at the time? I, I would say it affected me immeasurably. It, it was not a, such a such a trauma yeah. and I wasn't sure how to process this sort of grief. Did it that make seemed, harder? Or, um, it, it did in a way. I mean obviously there was just there was something that was so much larger than me and this pursuit of being a dancer. So like I had already cued into that. I think I've always been somewhat of a of an empath and feeling this pain. But like just New York in general had no like we had no idea and in the fear of like would an would a cultural um what's the word I'm looking for? Would a cultural iconic place like like in center possibly be the next target. So there was an actual physical fear, and then also coming from an army family, I knew immediately that there would be repercussions and that the people in my family would be called upon to defend. So it was a lot. It was a lot for a young woman to process and to not immediately have her family there. And, but I, I, I have to, I speak so much to what the School of American Ballet did at that time, and I just, you know, we didn't, we, like I had a Nokia, that old school dinosaur Nokia, and you couldn't even call your parents, like every, the cell towers were down, and when I finally did get in touch with my, my mom, she wanted me to stop dancing, but I felt that that wouldn't help the world, like my gift is in an indirect way giving that separate I, I, that separation from the terribleness of what occurs in our daily lives, I provide a release from that. Okay. It is also the story of a young woman of diverse background working her way up through a world of barriers to that success. I think your relationship with Peter, I won't say the last name because you don't, through most of the book, in the book is an example of this. Can you tell us more about that? Of, I kind of got lost in the question. Okay. Oh, so. Well, it's, it's the story of your working up with a diverse background through the New York City Valley. Oh, of being, so, yes. my, so you want me to speak to my, myself being a multicultural woman yeah. in the, yes. okay, yes. and how that and played, how were, and yeah. how that, how Peter didn't understand that. Yeah. Um, so, I didn't realize when I came to the School of American Ballet that I would end up being the first Asian American woman to ever be promoted out of the corps de ballet at New York City Ballet. Yeah. I had no idea that I was going to end up being able to be a ballerina for my job. And then when I did get this amazing opportunity, and it what you know I was given this opportunity by Peter, and then thrust into rebuilding myself. You know, you're, you're at the top of the school, you get into a company, and you have to work your way up again. All of a sudden, it was I was made very aware that I was other, that I was different, and so that's that has definitely impacted how I have practiced, how I have had to prove myself beyond the normal merits of um, someone who doesn't share my multicultural heritage, and I think that's what makes my lens and hearing this lens so important because it's a relatable voice. It's a voice of the global majority, mm -hmm. and even though ballet stems from a white Eurocentric culture, it is not just for European nobility anymore. I'm really trying to drive home the point that, like, if I can fall in love with it and experience all of the fraught 
relationships and hardships but still love it, yeah. it's worth saving. You invested in a ballet costume at one point. Why do you say that that was one of the wisest investments that you've made? Ah, so the ballerina tutu. Yes. It is not an inexpensive item, um, but it was an item that I thought I was I owed to myself because it was shortly after I got promoted, and I knew once at New York City Ballet, once you're promoted to soloist, you're allowed to do outside gigs. So I needed a costume that, first and foremost, was custom tailored to my body. Everything feels good when it's custom tailored to you, and more importantly I didn't want to have to borrow the dingy costumes that, that New York City Ballet lets you take away for obvious reasons you know like dancers can anything can happen like a suitcase can get lost I've heard stories of dancers leaving their tutus on the plane in the overhead bin which is unfortunate I didn't want to be one of those dancers and so you know I invested in myself to put for, forth not only my best foot but my best looking face and, and so when I represent not only myself I'm representing New York City Ballet and it's the prettiest costume I can find. Excellent. It's all part of branding, right? Yeah, it's part of branding. It's also cleaner and, and It's cleaner. It's it's just it's yeah, just right. this is right. mine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us about the Orphan Starfish Foundation and the final bow for Yellow Face Initiative? Yes. So Orphan Starfish Foundation was founded by my dear friend Andy Stein. Um, there will be a gala coming up in October, I believe it's October 30th, and it's the 20th anniversary. And um, I work with OSF in traveling to um, third world countries to work with the at-risk youth there. And um, one of my first first trips was to Nicaragua and I haven't, because of the political unrest, I have not been able to return. So it's devastating and it was right after I had torn my ACL and I had promised these young women who had gone through so much worse than I have that they would need a ballerina and I was devastated that I would disappoint them. And uh, through my various, you'll learn about my PT habits. Um, it's somewhat in the book, but like more coming in the marketing that like I saw as a particular healer who at least made it so I could go on the plane and walk with my knee brace and me not speaking the language. I understand Spanish, but I don't speak it fluently. What was able to be shared through this universal language of dance and how we were able to uplift each other these young women taught me more about myself than I could have ever. Okay, you mentioned adrenaline prominently in the book. What yes. qualifies or attributes do you feel were key to your success? Um, and, how it, and how it relates to adrenaline? Well, I thought that when, when, I, when I was reading it, I felt that you, you mentioned adrenaline because you felt it was part of how you got through some of the very hard moments. Um, I think adrenaline is just like, I feel like that's why people like jump out of planes. It's a sense of feeling alive. And so when I talk about adrenaline, it's really, there's, I think there, I think it could be fair to say that a lot of people think the ballet is boring. Like the, like the gentleman who just came here, he, he, he didn't think of it as it could be as exciting as watching a sports event. And I'm saying that, oh yes, yes it can be that exciting. And if anything, it's like, it's more, it's a contact sport that has no padding. <laughs> so, <True. laughs> so think more rugby yeah. than football. Um, American football, I should specify. Um, so that's what I talk about adrenaline in this passion that I sharing one's gift with an audience and then combining that with live music. It feels like this, um, it feels like a transformer movement, you know? It, I, and I, and I, okay, I'll, I'll, I'll say why I mentioned the adrenaline because I remember a passage where um, you were scheduled to perform, but someone on the uh, staff was making it very difficult for you to appear at the right moment. So, oh, yes, so, that's what I was going to plan to read. Oh, yes, that part, yeah, that's a good read. Okay. That's a good read. Okay, so 
does do you feel that that helped your success, or are there more other things that are more important? To you? I think inner. I think it's not. It's not about that. I feel like the adrenaline is. It's a side effect of getting if, of reaching this pinnacle of dance. But to get there, it's not like I used adrenaline to fuel myself through. That was just inner rage. <laughs> inner fury at injustice that fueled me to dance better. Um, I think I even mentioned it in a sentence that like I am someone who does well under extreme pressure. So it was sort of that. It was the sort of, it was the challenge of like, you think I can't do this. Not only when I show you I can do this, but I can excel at it. Okay, the physical, well, brings us to the next question. The physical demands of ballet of a ballet career are said to be more demanding than even the toughest of professional sports. How do you deal with that? And how long do you expect you can keep on doing it? How do I deal? Well, it's, it's, you know, I'm coming to you after an acupuncture appointment, a three hour muscle release therapy treatment on my day off yesterday, and a PT appointment. So it's so, so, so much recovery time on top of the training. Um, it's a lot of time management, which I fear right now I'm not doing very well. But um, it, it's you, and it's pushing forward. It's the, it's the discipline that is taught to, that is inherently based in the study of ballet that has made it also the discipline of recovery to be able to continue as an athlete. I mean, if you think of a Tom Brady, he does so much to set himself up to succeed, um, including being able to sleep at the right temperature. Now, I don't make enough money to be able to do <laughs> stuff like, like that or, or or to have a team come, you know, work with me at, at my home, but like every single dancer that's made it to a professional level puts that amount of effort into recovery. And so it very much is this hybrid. We are artists, but we are also supreme athletes. And I think that's a little you known fact. With, the, with your torn ACL, right? Or I did. did. I, so there are two different types of people when they, um, when they tear an ACL, there's like copers and non-copers. Turns out that I can withhold so much pain before I can have to stop that I was able to dance with a torn ACL. Granted, I was making like a brace with tape on my knee, um, but it was that. But that was also coming from a place of fear, a fear that I would, if I were to fix what I had broken, that I would lose my place in the company. Fear that. I, I had to put my life, my career, in the hands of a surgeon. Granted, you know, my surgeon was wonderful, Dr. Scott Radio. Um, he took such great care of me. It was a practice of trust, trust which I had not been afforded to up to that. I had not had a chance to build because of the inherent competitive nature of ballet. What is or are your favorite ballets to watch or perform? Ooh. Favorite ballets to watch and or perform? I have to say I'm a huge, huge fan of Symphony in Three Movements, which is a Balanchine black and white ballet, which partnership with um, Stravinsky, the composer. And there's such power, speaking of athleticism, such power with both the male and female, and it's a huge core ballet. It's not just about the principles in that situation. Um, I love to dance that. I still miss that because it's now being a soloist, I no longer dance my core roles. And that was one of the roles that I lamented giving up. Trust me, there were a lot of roles that I was ready to give up, but that not that one. <laughs> Um, so I still love watching it. I absolutely love performing uh, West Side Story, yeah. just because I get to utilize some of my other talents of you know acting and singing. Um, I to watch another one that's actually going this season, a serenade. I think it's beautiful and so so romantic, and just like that music just sweeps you off your feet. Um, I, I'm more of a 30-minute ballet than I am uh, a like a full length or I'm not a, um, so like, okay. I'm like a, let's give me three different things, give me a little, give me a little menu. 
Well, it, it is a, our society is, I think, much shorter to attention spans than what we're right. uh, happening in the 18th century. Well, I just think it's also just right now, I, I personally feel like our full lengths that we present, they're outdated. Uh -huh. They, they're telling stories about females that have no agency and, and, and I think we are due for an overhaul of what we present in our full length spectrum. But, um, so yeah, I'm happy to curate an evening of dance for anyone who wants to ask for one. I, think, I don't know if that was one of my questions. Do you write ballet or would you think about writing? I think that would be my dream job. Yeah. I think I, I'd love to be a dramaturg okay. of ballet. I'm not a choreographer. I am definitely, for as long as my body will allow me to dance, which is coming back to answer your question, I can't say how long. I, like, I think that's up to fate and that's up to, I'm, I'm blessed to be able to still do this now. I think I will transition into different kinds of storytelling, whether it's a reappearance back on Broadway or more TV um, and film. I have no intention of leaving City Valley in the near future, so. Um, I'm happy to hold it down on stage there, right. and but I'm always one for curiosity, and I want to tell new stories. So yes, I would be. I have new stories. I think that's also something that Final Wow for Yellow Face is doing. We are going to become gold standards arts, and, and we've already have six major ballet companies committed to telling new stories with. It, it, so with all Asian creative casts, that, and I that think part that's of the important. Wasn't what is Final Bow for Yellow Face actually? What it, so Final Bow for Yellow Face is a diversity initiative that I started with uh, the best friend Phil Chan, and it happened around the time I got injured in 2017. You know, not one to stay idle, um, and we were already having discussions. A um, lot of discussions were happening within the ballet world about how we can make our stages more inclusive, how do we diversify, how do we... And it just, it stemmed from me posing a question and being like, what are we going to do about the Chinese divertissement in the Nutcracker? And I can, I talk about it in the book and you can read more about it there, but since then it started off as a pledge. You know, I love ballet and in order for it to survive into the future, I'm committed to holding myself accountable for talking to my artistic directors, the fellow dancers around me, that we have to eliminate outdated and offensive stereotypes of, of Asians on stage. So it's since blossomed. We are in our fifth year. We are a toddler now. And we are now holding companies accountable. We're, we've got, got following up, like six, six different companies have committed to all Asian creative teams telling Asian stories by 2024, 25, and that's huge and really exciting. Is that strictly ballet or does it go into other performances? I think it's, it, well, like, ballet is my lane. Yeah. And already inspired, we, we've we inspired the Asian Opera Alliance. And so they're doing what a model of our work in, in the opera space, which is amazing. That's the whole point. It's to empower, empower individuals. Phil and I didn't start this discussion, and we're not going to finish it, and we need everyone to, to work together in their own respective arts lanes to really create tangible change, not just posting a black square on an Instagram, not just, you know, not just performative um, actions, but real tangible change. So you see this going into the future? Absolutely. That's something you will continue to do? Absolutely. Something. All right. Um, now you kind of answered this partly already, but I'll ask it anyway. Cats and West Side Story were big shows for you. Can you tell us a bit about performing? What can I say about being in Cats? I think it's uh, that was really just a trip, <laughs> quite literally. Um, but it taught me so much about creativity. Doing the same show eight times a week but never feeling bored. That was one of the things that I thought I was going to really struggle with when I chose to embark upon that challenge, that journey. And it was wild to be able to reinvent, like to be so comfortable and get a chance to do something that many times and develop a character. And also just the, the Broadway family. And it ended up 
shining a floodlight on my world of ballet and how we are not necessarily treated as adults or in individuals in our in our lane as ballerinas, dancers, and this includes men too, but um, but in the Broadway setting, everyone from you know stagehand to um, the security guard to usher was collectively working towards putting this show on every night. As absurd as Cats is, um, and then just as far as like being part of a global phenomenon. What performance again? What, Pardon? What period did you do that performance in Cats? I was in Cats from 2016 to 2017. Oh, I didn't get it. No. Okay. All right. Um, oh, and West Side Story. Anything to add about West Side Story? Um, I mean, West Side Story, I have only performed through New York City Ballet, and I think what's what's been so, it, that gave me wings, it really affirmed in me that I do have a, a want and a desire to express myself with my words, and with my voice. So as an actress as well as an actress. Yeah, it, 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 like, it was so unique that all of a sudden I felt like the various facets of me came together and amplified everything. And so obviously I dance a lot as Anita. And I think that's that's what made that show so special. It looked great too. Thanks. Do you enjoy, oh well, okay, that's actually, I enjoy other types of dance. Okay. Here's the question. Do you enjoy other types of dance or other arts or activities? And would you consider writing as well to be a new pursuit beyond your dancing? I do consider writing to be a new pursuit. I am, I, I think through my work with American Dance Machine for the 21st Century and the forays onto, into Broadway, that gives me a chance to flex different um, Think of it as languages, dance languages. So I think I really appreciate learning dance style. And so I'm always curious. And if I ever have a, a down period, which doesn't seem to be happening any soon, anytime <laughs> soon, but uh, it, I, will, I will steep myself in a new practice because I feel like I am an inherently curious person and I think I will always be a student in a way. Um, the adrenaline again. Yeah, I think it's a, it, that's where my competitiveness comes in. Is to, like, it's, it's with myself. It's always about like, how, do I, how can I learn more? And there's always something that I can take and bring back into what I'm focusing in on at the moment. So yes, I, I'm, I'm open to storytelling in any way that can happen. Any other arts or activities? Um, I'm not. I, believe it or not, like I'm not a good drawer, like at all. Um, I do like to sing. I'm. It's not like my first talent. Um, I really, really enjoy the spoken word. I really enjoy like being able to express myself. I enjoy reading out loud. I really enjoyed the process of the audiobook. Mm -hmm. um, so we'll see. I feel like, I hope that this this book will open more doors. Not only for me, but for people coming to Back to the Ballet, you know? It's a, it's a give and a, and a take, that it's mutually beneficial. Okay. Um. Now, uh, the big question, do you have any books coming out in the near future or anything else, new projects that you can tell us about? I have many new projects coming <laughs> out. No books for the time being. Okay. Book, book two and three we'll have to think about a little bit. Um, but I just curated my first evening of dance with the NYC Free Festival on Little Island. That was really magical and you, I'll, you'll be able to see that program soon, as soon as I get it edited, as soon as, um, and then to see me dance, I will be on stage at the New York City Ballet, casting TVD, I, as you will learn in the book, it's not privy to me at this moment in time, and the thing that I'm very excited about is Fall for Dance, um, we are making a world premiere with the Fosse Verdon legacy of three vignettes that Gwen had danced on 
TV show appearances. I believe two Bob Hope, one Ed Sullivan. We've stitched them together in a magical way. I'm dancing with two amazing gentlemen and it's entitled Sweet Glen Sweet. Those tickets go on sale September 19th at 11 a.m. They will sell out. So <laughs> they absolutely will sell it. They're only $15. They're accessible. We'll get this on YouTube before that. And then uh, the performances are October 13th and 14th. And which is funny because I said, no, the book's not, I have no other books, but there's a different version of Swan Dive being released in the UK on October 14th. So with a different cover. Which is yeah, kind of covers, not a completely different cover, that's which is amazing, yes, which yes. is such that's a whole conversation in itself. Like what what will market to the United States and what yes. will market to yeah. the uh, I the think UK? Partial to UK covers, I think they do a really good job. On that. I think they do too. I mean, obviously this one's hilarious. This is yeah. this is the, like hung over yeah, yeah. on a beanbag chair, kind of right you know? It's <laughs> <laughs> good. Okay, now here's here's the moment of truth. Holding up your book. Could you give us an unabashed pitch for your book, Swan Dive, and why we should want to read it? Oh, God. Okay. Why have to do this? This is Swan Dive. <laughs> this is my memoir. And if it's good enough for Misha Barishnikov, it's good enough for you. <laughs> I mean, if it's good enough for Cheetah Rivera, it's good enough for you. Zach Posen, Andy Blankenbuehler, and Jose Antonio Vargas, it's good for you. Yeah, read, read it. Read the book. Read the book. Um, let me do a serious one. You can pick and choose. I don't really yeah, don't care. Ahead. I'd be like, this is Swan Dive, the making of a rogue ballerina. If you've ever wanted to know what it's really like to be a multicultural woman in a ballet company, or just want to hear a story of what it's like to be a woman in this time. It takes place in a ballet setting, but it, this is really a book that speaks to all women. And honestly, if it's good enough for Chita Rivera, Andy Blankenbuehler, Misha Brishnikov, Zach Posen, and Jose Antonio Vargas, I think it's good enough for you. I like both versions. It's going to be hard to <laughs> Okay, and finally, can you read a passage for us? For us yes. From is it going to be too loud? or we're... You know, it is a pretty good, um, this is what they call a, uh, a telescope mic. Okay. So it's pretty good at taking sound out. There will be background sound. Okay. Hopefully, I mean, I'm happy to. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Georgina Telescope Mic. Reading from Swan Dive. Swan Dive. The Making of the Rogue Ballerina, Swan Dive, number four. The crappy, wet, gray weather did not make for a magical morning on the Disney cruise, especially when hungover. Fast forward a few years to 2012. I am of legal drinking age here, readers. My sister Christina had landing a gig performing in one of their Broadway caliber musicals, and my mom and I booked a cruise to watch her show and soak up some sun. Sunshine, why art thou forsaking me? I sprang for the wine package, plus a package of Dramamine, ensuring plenty of booze with my crews. Hence the hangover. Mom sipped her coffee as Seamus danced over the deck. Look, I know what I need. Fries. My mom looked at me like I had announced I was going to eat the entire goddamn buffet, as well as anyone standing within five feet of it. Gina, you think that's a wise choice? I looked at my mother. How dare she shame me on a Disney cruise? You know what? I'll just go enjoy my fries on the children's deck. No one is going to bat an eye at me there. I stomped up to the next level, the water on the stairs squishing about my very cute, but not boat friendly, Bernardo sandals. I got my fries. The combo of heat and the smell of freshly fried potatoes instantly comforted me as I made my way to a pool chair to eat my breakfast of champs in a shame-free environment. I'm almost there, and then I feel it. I'm hydroplaning on these bullshit sandals like Bambi on an iced over lake. Activate core stability, Gina. Ah, shit. I'm flat on my back, my life-sustaining fries strewn haphazardly about. Now that I think about it, 
Was there a warning about wearing non-rubber shoes on deck? I start to sit up and collect myself when I see a large figure quickly lumbering toward me. An enormous, white-gloved hand-slash-paw is extended toward me and I realize that Goofy has come to my rescue. Before I can compute this, Goofy has expertly scooped me up off the floor. Yeah, the training for looking after kiddos, basically tiny drunk people, comes in handy for actual hungover people and has seated me in the chair. Uh, thank you so much. He can't talk. That would be breaking character. I'm thinking about how embarrassing it's going to be to get back in line for more fries when Mickey Mouse himself appears. He too is silent, but his over-exaggerated gestures suggest next level jolliness. And more importantly, he's holding an extra large order of fries. He sets them down in front of me, bows gallantly, and dashes off. I am left alone to eat my french fries in peace. Dreams do fucking come true. That's excellent. So thank you very much, Georgina pascal Green. We have enjoyed learning about your endeavors, struggles, and successes, and we look forward to more great accomplishments from you in the future. Swan Dive is published by Henry Holt Publishing and is available now. Look for the link in the description below to buy your own copy. Thank you, Georgina. Thank you.